Greetings from Seattle, Washington, USA. I'm Nancy Gonlin of Bellevue College, and I'm a Mesoamerican archaeologist. In keeping with the theme of the conference, my presentation is on Dangers in the Night, Archaeological Case Studies of the Ancient Mayas of Mesoamerica. One of the greatest challenges in studying the night is that we humans are a diurnal species. One must stay alert from dusk to dawn while maintaining keen observations and participating in nightlife. The inquiry into ancient nights presents its own hurdles since the objects of our interest may lie buried in the past and literally in the dark in the ground. Many archaeologists and I have successfully utilized a perspective I created called the archaeology of the night. In this presentation, the ancient Mayas who lived in Mexico and Central America in this area are highlighted to illustrate that the dangers of the night are by no means a modern phenomenon. A note of consequence is that today, millions of descendants of the Mayas have persisted through wars, colonialism, and ongoing struggles. They have generously allowed us archaeologists to intrude into their current life ways to help us better understand their pasts. The living Maya descendants, like all of us, now experience a different night sky and world than our ancestors before. Electricity and light pollution have drastically altered the nightscapes as we now know them. Section 2. Dangers in Ancient Maya Nights. The homelands of the ancient Mayas encompassed the neotropics that thrived with crepuscular and nocturnal creatures that formed part of the cultural landscape. Jaguars, bats, owls, poisonous snakes, spiders, centipedes, scorpions, and other potentially dangerous animals were imbued with powers to harm humans. Animals emerged as dusk settled in, devouring crops and destroying one's livelihood. Night hunting was sometimes necessary and desirable to acquire nocturnal beasts and to traverse this otherworldly landscape. Pictured on this polychrome vase from the late classic period, 600 to 900 CE, deer are featured against a black background with star glyphs around the rim, symbolizing darkness and night. Deer were a favored food, but sometimes their beings could be co-opted into something evil. Jeremy Coltman states that, quote, the forest wilds were under the domain of primeval night and were home to some of the most powerful and dangerous beings conjured up in the ancient Maya religious and philosophical imagination. End quote. It was not advisable to be out alone walking the trails at night as one's own senses were tested, as well as the dangerous metaphorical darkness. Supernatural beings called Y brought disease and destruction to those who came upon them, and they frequented the night. Epigrapher David Stewart found that, quote, the ancient Y beings represented the animate dark forces that were embedded in the complex power structures of ancient Maya society. Y beings more accurately represent demonic forces, frightening spooks, and agents of disease, all closely tied to the exercise of coercive influence among high ranking Maya elites." End quote. Other dangers of the night emanated from one's fellow human being in the form of warfare. Some battles may have occurred at night or dawn when the element of surprise would have been greatest. Murals from Bonham Park, a classic Maya city in Chiapas, Mexico, illustrate this strategy. Art historian Mary Miller has decoded the murals in structure one. Our focus is on room two a battle scene dated to July 19th, 786 CE. 
King Yasal Chan Muan of Bonam Pak, and soldiers attack and succeed in obtaining captives. The darkness of the background and symbols of stars and constellations indicate that this skirmish likely occurred at night. Temptations at night are different sorts of danger that ancient Maya people faced. The moon and tobacco are intimately associated with nocturnal desires. Moon represents temptation. She brings light, but also indulgence. A quote by Martin Pickens is illustrative. Moon is the mother of intoxication, whether by sweetness, sexuality, sorcery, alcohol, or tobacco, end quote. Tobacco was a powerful, dark, desired substance that heightened one's powers. In classic Maya iconography, smoking is a cue for the night, as seen on this pottery vessel. Apart from portrayals on pots, archaeologists now rely upon residue analysis to uncover the contents of vessels. Jennifer Loff Miller Cardinal analyzed several small pots known as snuff bottles or flasks, shown here, that were used to store dried tobacco. Maya shamans utilized intoxicants to great effect to commune with ancestors, spirits, and beings of this world and beyond. Overindulgence, however, had its consequences. The dangers of tobacco are well known today, as well as the pleasures of smoking. It is little wonder that this potent plant was afforded the respect it deserved by the Mayas. Other dangers of the night were in the form of alcohol. The Maya invented numerous types of beverages, some of which were fermented, such as pulque, coyo wine, manioc beer, balche, and cacao from chocolate beans. Some of these beverages bubbled and foamed, a clear indication of divine presence. Such effervescence could come from within due to the fermentation process, or it could be created by beating or pouring, as shown in, on this classic Maya vase that depicts a woman pouring a cacao drink from great heights to achieve a top layer of foam. The dangers of the night for the ancient Mayas were numerous and commingled the natural and supernatural. Nocturnal predators on the prowl, risk-taking in the form of hunting, why beings roaming the landscape, soldiers involved in nighttime raids and temptations from intoxicants and hallucinogens, made facing the night a dark business. Yet most people survived and thrived to prosper another day. Strategies to face these dangers head on were adaptive, comforting, and necessary in a world without the luxury of lighting round the clock. Section three, mitigating the dangers of the night. One way to keep at bay what lurked in the dark was to illuminate it. Iconographic evidence for torches is plentiful and the Maya wrote about torches too, creating a symbol that resembled the torch itself. Nocturnal palisines are cued by the presence of torches to brighten dark interiors, chase away the dampness, and to better read one's political partners. Remains of the three stone hearth occur in the archeological record in the form of ash lenses, but in rare cases, the actual stones symbolically and functionally valuable, were left behind. Such was the case at the classic Maya community of Hoya de Serena, El Salvador, where a volcanic eruption surprised inhabitants of this farming village on an August night in 630 CE. In-depth knowledge of plant life was utilized to great effect by ancient and modern Maya peoples alike. Numerous plants of the night were employed to combat illnesses, according to ethnobotanist Venetia Slotin. For example, assistance with sleep could be achieved through the aptly named sleeper plant 
Mimosa pudica. One of the most prominent ways to mitigate warfare is the construction of fortifications. One such enormous defense dates to the end of the pre-classic period in Mesoamerica around 100 to 200 CE at the Maya site of Bacon in Campeche, Mexico. The walls of this earthwork, studied by David Webster and Joe Ball, were several meters high and enclosed a space that was large enough to protect at a minimum those who lived within the enclosure. Religion and ritual helped alleviate nocturnal dangers. The phase of the new moon was an ominous time, notably for the moon goddess and fertility of plants. Timings and events were carefully aligned to ensure propitious outcomes. God El was one of the principal lords of the underworld and often portrayed as aged, painted black, smoking a cigar and wearing a hat with an owl. According to Carl Taub, he notes that as a merchant god, God El often appears with a merchant bundle or staff or spear. If one were a Maya trader traveling at night, as the later Mexica merchants did, one would conjure God El's name for safety's sake and waft tobacco smoke, warding off Y beings and other harmful creatures. Tobacco afforded protection, provided one used this powerful substance with the required respect. In contemporary Maya societies, studied by Kevin Groark, one typically rubs a tobacco lime preparation over the body to counter danger. Tobacco serves as an effective mediator between darkness and nocturnal perils. For numerous substances of the dark, whether tobacco or fermented cacao, proscriptions and proper procedures for ritual consumption help to regulate ill effects and misuse. Section four, concluding the night. I have outlined some of the nocturnal dangers faced by the ancient Mayas and how they mitigated these dangers. Danger clearly shaped their cultures in numerous ways. How well nocturnal risks were dealt with could affect one's well-being, livelihood, and success in society on a daily, nightly, and long-term basis. The allure of danger, however, was ever-present in forms from substances to sex. Night was an active time for the ancient Mayas, filled with various dangers from animals to supernatural entities, and the Maya people cleverly devised mechanisms to mitigate such risks through the darkness of the night. Today, many Maya peoples have adapted to changing nights and mitigate them in different but no less effective ways than their ancestors did. Acknowledgements. Gratitude is due to Dr. Manuel Garcia Ruiz and Dr. Jordi Nafe for organizing the conference and proceedings. Rocio Herrera Reyes kindly edited El Resumen en Español. Images were generously shared by Rafael Cobos, Justin Kerr, Jennifer Loff Miller Cardinal, Mary Miller, Venetia Slotten, David Webster, Randolph Widmer, and Mark Zender. A special thanks to the World Land Trust. Many thanks to Christine Dixon Hundredmark, David Reed, and Kay Viswanathan for their support, insights, and edits. Thank you all for listening. Uh, <clears throat> thank you everyone for coming. Thanks to the uh, organizers, of course, and uh, to all of you who survived uh, three very interesting days, but still, you know, the third day of the conference, especially after lunch. I hope you've all had coffee. So. Uh, let's let's get going. My um, presentation, as you can see, is about uh, transformation of the night city, of the nocturnal city, or the inner city, and uh, trying to shed some light on the political economy of the urban uh, nighttime industry or leisure industry of uh, immigrants in Israel. And so, yeah, twenty minutes. Um, let's see if, right. So. This isn't. So I'm gonna, you know, sort of a conceptual framework, really. Um, and um, 
you know, there's been quite a bit of discussion in the last uh, 10 or 15 years about the 24 seven city, about how cities are attempting to conquer the night uh, in the neoliberal urban uh, age. The nighttime economy is a set of uh, spatial temporal policies, uh, the idea behind which is to boost economic growth and restore social order to declining central business district. The history is, you know, goes back to the late 70s and early 80s in Europe and the US. Um, and the leisure industry is a salient tool uh, or strategic tool in, uh, in the process of revamping CBDs. Uh, the downside, of course, as we all know, and we've heard in the last few days, is that um, there's some issues, especially with young people, uh, with alcohol uh, consumption and with the fear of crime. And uh, this is also something we've heard about the need to regulate the nighttime economy. But I guess the question is whose economy or whose nighttime economy is being regulated, uh, how and um, what exactly the, the tools are for doing that. Um, sorry, let me go down here. Right, so just by way of um, sort of giving you a background on Israel's urban nighttime economy, um, in fact, the leisure industry and the entire economy has in many Israeli cities has in the last uh, 30 or so years has been suburbanized, meaning it, uh, it uh, sort of relocated uh, or uh, it's been relocated to areas in the fringe of the cities, uh, suburbs, uh, whether in closed industrial or mixed use zones, uh, usually away from residential neighborhoods. And we're talking about mostly bars and restaurants that cater both to young people and uh, to um, uh, you know, whole families. Um, recently, uh, and when I say recently, I mean the last uh, 10 or so years, probably from the uh, 2010 or so, there's a, an urban renewal frenzy across the country, which takes both residential and commercial uh, um, um, uh, purposes. Uh, residential, I'm not gonna talk about too much obviously, but it's motivated by what's called Tama 38. You can see the, uh, you can probably recognize the number 38 there in the little uh, uh, picture there. This is a national master plan that's uh, supposed to strengthen uh, older buildings in neighborhoods to withstand earthquakes, but of course it is used uh, to do much more that. Uh, and, and I'll talk about it maybe later. Uh, the commercial sort of aspect of, uh, of urban renewal is uh, motivated mostly by entrepreneurial cities who seek to reinvigorate their CBDs in order to attract both businesses and residents. And so the result is really, uh, since I'd say the probably the uh, uh, mid 2000s, is a massive back to the inner city uh, movement of both capital and people, to paraphrase Neil Smith's uh, uh, famous uh, article from uh, 1979. And so, um, my notes here. Um, the problem is, or the challenge is that um, during the, uh, the years that the, uh, the central business district were sparsely occupied or Part, you know, uh, partly vacated, they were populated. They're ha they had been populated by uh, uh, or inhabited by other groups. And um, many of these neighborhoods, these very same neighborhoods have been settled by migrants uh, uh, from the uh, 1990s, either labor migrants uh, or asylum seekers who uh, arrived in Israel in, that, uh, in the last three decades. And I, you know, the reason for them being drawn to these old and neglected uh, but centrally located neighborhoods are very, I think, uh, commonsensical, right? They have central, they're centrally located. Uh, they have a, an abundance of cheap accommodation, you know, apartments. Many apartments actually are being divided by greedy landlords who want to maximize uh, uh, their return on, on their property. Uh, and of course, you know, the emergence of vibrant ethno-racial communities. And as we know, with ethno-racial communities or with migrant communities, uh, like anywhere else in the world, there emerges a uh, the ethnic economy, and part of it is the uh, <coughs> excuse me the the, the nighttime uh, ethnic economy. Uh, the migrant economy and the nighttime economy, in particular, are made up of uh, at the moment of probably you know data is really difficult to come by, but 
we're definitely talking about uh, hundreds of migrant owned businesses in inner city neighborhoods, uh, predominantly in the city of Tel Aviv, but I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the entire metro area, which is made up of about 15 or so cities. And so some of these processes are going to um, are, are pretty much repeating themselves in other cities. So on the right hand, you can see some examples, you know, this is a, an Eritrean uh, restaurant and you can see a, a, an Indian grocery store. So like I said, it's predominantly in Tel Aviv, but it also um, um, sort of uh, um, moves along uh, the, the, the metro surface into secondary cities. And, you know, you can find food shops, uh, clothing, footwear, you know, the, the sort of normal things, a lot of telecommunication, you know, cell phones and so on and so forth. Um, many of them uh, are open late uh, for both for economic reasons, but also in order to accommodate migrants long uh, working hours, you know, many of them work, uh, you know, 15, 16 hours a day, you know, they, they get home uh, very, very late at night and so uh, stores remain open. Um, leisure oriented establishments are typically open later, again, for obvious reasons. The thing is that the regulated, uh, at least in theory, they should be regulated uh, like any other Israeli business in terms of licensing, uh, requirements of licenses, uh, hours of operation, and so on and so forth. The exception, I would say, to this rules are the uh, Hamaras or Eritrean bars. Uh, Eritrean, and I, I did not mention it, but Eritrean and Sudanese um, asylum seekers uh, 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 have arrived in Israel in the uh, late uh, 2000s, probably between 2007 to 2012, before the border was sealed. There's about 40,000 of them uh, in Israel right now, about half are located or settled in Tel Aviv. Uh, in these particular neighborhoods I'm going to be talking about, the others are kind of spread around in secondary cities, but very much in the same type of neighborhoods. So Eritrean bars, which are essentially the, the, the sort of focus of this uh, paper are treated differently. And so the question, one of the questions that I'm trying to sort of address in this paper um, is, uh, you know, why, and uh, more importantly, why now? Now the explanations, the, uh, the sort of traditional explanations that are given are all, I'd say, you know, pivot around a set of uh, factors that have to do with public safety. So their illegality, you know, the fact that many of them are illegal, uh, you can see some examples on the right there. Some of them are essentially uh, are being set up in, in, in apartments or, or parts of apartments. So the fact that they're illegal and unlicensed, uh, the fact that, um, that there's a, uh, quite a bit of complaints about disorderly conduct, a lot of uh, violence uh, by uh, individuals who frequent these bars and especially when they leave the bars. And then just a general sort of fear factor that individuals, you know, either visitors or, or residents feel when uh, when they're um, in, in and around or around these, these establishments. But my argument, the argument I'm trying to advance in this paper is that there's a complementary explanation for the, certainly for the timing. Um, and that has to do with the, what I call the political economy of urban regeneration in Israel. Now, I wanna, I wanna be clear and say that I don't um, deny the, these sort of explanations that I just presented, um, but, um, um, because both, as, as I'll show you in a minute, residents as well as the residents in, in those neighborhoods, um, <clears throat> as well as the, uh, uh, you know, uh, representatives of the authorities, um, uh, in fact, complain and, and bring, you know, decent evidence that, they, that, that there is a certain problem there and that it's a challenge. But um, I, I, in my, you know, in my research, uh, at least the, the, uh, the, the sort of, uh, conclusions that I've reached so far is that there's a complementary explanation, like I said, and it has to do with the political economy of urban regeneration. Now, if you want to uh, get sort of the, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, policy makers uh, uh, kind of position, you know, this is a very long quote, but I'll just, uh, just read the, the uh, parts in red. You know, they're all, this is a uh, uh, South Tel Aviv chief of, pol uh, chief of police who said uh, almost 11 years ago, uh, they're not all criminals or lawbreakers, but there's a problem with uh, how they conduct both at daylight and after dark. Level of violence has risen in the area. Uh, he attributes the, um, the excessive drinking to the fact that they're coming from very, very traditional countries. Um, 
And um, what I have to deal with, he says, is the sense of safety that I'm supposed to provide to citizens uh, who walk around the area. All these pubs we tried to shut down at 11 p.m. Um, similarly, the uh, uh, VP or vice manager of the, the uh, uh, city's department of inspection recently said, uh, you know, because they are drunk, you know, that's part of the problem. Uh, those who stay there in Hamaras until late hours reach very high levels of intoxication, end up engaging in violent incidents. We press really hard there. In other words, um, they, uh, from, from the side of the authorities, they admit that there's definitely a problem, but also residents who are occasionally interviewed in, in the media provide a fairly similar, I'd say, um, a picture. You know, clients are mostly foreign workers. This is from an uh, inner city neighborhood in the, resi the, um, uh, the city of Rishon Lezion, which is about 15 miles along the coast south of Tel Aviv. So it's along the Mediterranean as well. Clients are mostly foreign workers. Uh, they come to these pubs and drink all night. Uh, and then they end up lying in street corners, overwhelmed with alcohol. Many times they fight. It's like, you know, world wars here under our homes. Uh, this is just before Corona broke out. And then uh, a couple of years before that, uh, another uh, fellow uh, a woman uh, from the uh, um, uh, neighborhood of Neve Shana, which is in southern Tel Aviv, the largest concentration of uh, um, asylum seekers and labor migrants in Israel, says, you know, it bothers my sleep. Uh, I call the police. Uh, they shut down these places. Uh, uh, they come, uh, inspectors and policemen come by and shut them, but they immediately reopen. Uh, they break the law freely and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think I, it, it is, I don't think it can be denied that uh, it is a challenge or it has been a challenge for quite some time. But what I am arguing is that um, um, although some of these bars pose a challenge to, to, to residents and the visitors and, you know, possibly to the authorities, they've been a while uh, for, for quite some time. And so the question is what happened now? And, and, and my argument is that um, the, this, this sort of wave, this massive uh, regeneration of inner cities uh, in, at, across uh, Israeli cities in the last, uh, I wanted to say decade, but it's not even a decade. I mean, you can see here um, outline plans that were approved by some of these, uh, some of the, the major cities in this uh, central part of the, of the country, which is the Tel Aviv metropolitan area. The city of Tel Aviv approved its uh, Tel Aviv 5,000 plan just about five years ago. Rishon Lezion, a, a, a city of about 250,000 people. Uh, a year later, Ashdod, which is a little further down the coast, a couple of years later, and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to bore you with the details, but you can trust me that, you know, the, the, the sort of purple areas where um, the, the massive kind of uh, um, uh, uh, areas that are going to be uh, renewed are also the exact same areas where the majority of, of asylum seekers and their nighttime economies are are concentrated. And so it's it's you know it's it's um, it's a bit uh, uh, you know the the, the sort of uh, there's there's an interesting overlap here. Um, all of these programs, um, like I said, include a major component of regeneration of city center and adjacent neighborhoods. Uh, you know this is. Um, if we stick to Neil Smith's, uh, you know, concept of the, the neoliberal ravenous city, you know, one of the purposes is to clear the area and displace the undesirables. Uh, you know, as he put it, the revenge against public enemies of the bourgeoisie uh, political and economic order, you know, minorities, the working class and, and, and recent immigrants. Um, and so there's, there's obviously stricter regulation in, in recent years of local establishments, both residential and commercial. Um, and illegal businesses, I argue, like Hamaras, are, are most easily or more easily targeted. Now, the way to regulate or to to, uh, to sort of deal with these uh, with these bars is through you know it kind of differs across cities, of course, uh, but it's a combination of legal and administrative uh, closure ordinances. Um, so I'm not going to get into it, but you know, there's legal ordinance, which is much slower because you have to notify the, the, the business owner, you have to summon him to court, then the court takes time until it decides and so on and so forth. Administrative ordinance is much faster. This is something the Department of Inspection goes there, identifies the problem, you know, it brings the, the form that needs to be signed to the mayor, the mayor signs it and it's, uh, it's closed immediately. Um, the problem is that it li it's limited to 30 days. And so after one month, 
um, you have to uh, sort of start renegotiate with him or, or let him reopen uh, in most cases. Um, the other thing that happens uh, more and more frequently is closure operations. These are nighttime raids by the police and other authorities, or the tax authority in case there's tax, uh, tax evasion or the electric uh, representatives of the electric, uh, electric corporation to see whether all the, you know, the, the wires are, are hooked up the way they're supposed to. And, and of course, uh, uh, health ministry and so on and so forth. Now, the interesting thing is that these operations, or maybe it's not, it's not so surprising, started out in Tel Aviv, but uh, because that was where the, the, the largest concentration of these businesses uh, was. But it slowly spread out to other cities like the ones that I've mentioned and even cities uh, in, in sort of much more peripheral areas. And they become more frequent and, and very often more violent. And, and, and there's, there's a whole debate on who orchestrates them, whether it's the police or the city, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into it. There's a, as you can imagine, the data is, 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 uh, is very scarce, but I think there's a certain uh, pattern that emerges across cities and that's where renewal plans and gentrification and more recently in the last 20 or so months, the pandemic has uh, 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 reared its head. Uh, so all of these things in combination lead to stricter regulation and closure of migrant owned illegal businesses, particularly those associated with the nighttime economy like Hamaras. So in Tel Aviv, for example, although the number doesn't seem very high, you know, the last, uh, not last, but between uh, 2012 and 2017, you can say only, only um, um, half of the legal ordinances uh, that were issued by the city targeted migrant owned businesses. Um, but again, we're talking about a population that's about maybe 10% of, uh, uh, of, this, of the, the total population of the city. So probably about 30,000 or 40,000 people out of 400 or, or so uh, uh, people, 450 almost, who live in Tel Aviv. And there's, there's in fact a decline in absolute numbers, but like I say, in relative terms, we're talking about 50% of, of closed businesses. And again, I'm not denying that it's, it, it, uh, it has other reasons, but I'm just saying that uh, there's, there's a certain uh, there's interesting parallel here. Um, again, I see that I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna skip this. In 2015, the city of Tel Aviv established a municipal security patrol. The purpose is to increase the sense of personal safety. And you, you're not gonna be surprised to find out that most of their work has focused on Southern neighborhoods. Um, this is a commander in, in, in that unit who said a few years ago, you know, very proudly, coffee is now served instead of beer in Hamaras of the foreign community, meaning we've uh, de-alcoholized them, or, you know, I don't even know if that's a word, but I just, I've just invented a, a word. Um, in other cities like Rishon Lezion, you know, Hamar has been in existence since 2015 at least. So other, uh, other folks I talked to said probably even longer. Um, yet only recently, as one uh, journalist put it, the city has waged a war on Hamaras. Uh, and why now? I think residents themselves are not very convinced that it was just simple bureaucracy that prevented the city from acting so far. You know, they said this wouldn't have happened in a different neighborhood um, in the western part of the city. The western part of the city is uh, the more affluent sections. Um, it was, it's just convenient that it all happens here. Now, I, I would say it was convenient, but now as inner cities brace for uh, sort of a facelift, uh, it isn't anymore. And I think this statement is, uh, or this sentiment is perhaps best illustrated in, uh, and I'm, I'm very close to finishing, in the words of the mayor of Petah Tikva, another major city uh, just uh, northeast of, of Tel Aviv, who said very recently, about half a year, not even half a year ago, you know, we work feverishly with all the tools at our disposal to eradicate the various phenomena in the center of the city, which undermine the quality of life of local residents. In addition, closure of illegal businesses, as well as the closure of Hamaras, are part of our vision for the regeneration of city center, and we will not compromise about that. So just by way of conclusion, um, what I'm trying to establish in this, um, this paper is to show that there's, uh, or to show the effect, uh, the linkages between, the correlation between urban renewal and the um, closure of migrant owned uh, businesses. Sorry, this should shut it up. Um, 
and to show that there's a there's a very sort of wide or large regulatory toolbox. Um, and I think there's an interesting kind of um, uh, spatial logic here as a, and as a geographer, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that, of this. Um, you have concentration, then closure, then displacement, dispersion to secondary or tertiary cities, concentration in those cities, and then uh, I think closure again. So, uh, you know, if I had to kind of put it in the, um, you know, the, the, the sort of spatial logic behind the political economy of the rise and fall of migrant owned businesses, you know, you start with a certain concentration in the southern part of Tel Aviv of individuals, of migrant, nighttime economy emergence, urban renewal, gentrification, regulation, and the COVID effect ensue, displacement, search for affordable living environments in other cities, uh, and then uh, emergence of NTEs there as well. And then the same, uh, the same thing happens and uh, displacement uh, uh, follows. Uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. That's a really, really interesting presentation. Um, okay, let's let's hear Valeria and Francesca. So, yes, sir. okay. Uh, I think you should see the presentation, right? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for the conference, uh, for the opportunity to be here, uh, for me and for Valeria. Uh, our presentation uh, uh, is entitled Nighttime Security and Social Interaction, the development of tonight project in Turin, Italy. And uh, why we are here? Well, uh, both me and Valeria, we are part of the University of Turin, even if uh, we work in different uh, departments. Uh, Valeria is in the law department instead for me I'm a geographer uh, as well as the, uh, the previous presentation um, but we are also involved in this project uh, tonight project uh, Valeria as a UIA expert urban innovative actions uh, um, initiative and me uh, I'm involved in a startup um, um, company that is trying to develop a technology uh, to change the perception of people throughout storytelling. Uh, so we are here both from an academic point of view that a, a practical an empirical uh, uh, perspective. Um, so first of all, the, we try to, uh, well, we have uh, just uh, a few uh, slides to try to uh, explain what we are going to, to say. Uh, we will start uh, um, to try to understand the European policy contest for security and um, to understand what is the EFUS, uh, the European Forum of Urban Security. Uh, after that, we will try to concentrate our presentation on the Italian, uh, focus on the Italian situation. And then uh, to understand uh, why the night, why night in the security urban agenda. And uh, throughout the tonight project, uh, try to, to see uh, which could be the first result of a project that can try to um, understand how security uh, issues uh, um, are managed, we can say, uh, in the night uh, time. Uh, so we will have uh, some um, uh, results, but also some questions that we would like to discuss with you. So um, to start with the European policy context, uh, um, well, as in the other presentation, we will talk about the cities, why cities and not other uh, geographical uh, areas. Why? Because the cities are, of course, uh, very central in the discussion of security. Uh, and also because, um, as you probably know, the two thirds of the European population live in urban areas. Uh, so people concentrate 
rate in uh, in uh, urban area and this is an increasing trend so um, uh, probably uh, we will expect much more people living in cities and uh, we we like to we like to say that cities are places where both uh, problems concentrate but also the solution uh, can be found uh, why because um, also in the past the city uh, have been uh, um, places where of uh, experimentation uh, places where people uh, uh, meet uh, and also but that's also well the, the problem uh, uh, rise uh, more uh, in more evidence as for example the pollution um, and the security uh, for sure uh, is a matter is a very uh, important uh, issues uh, and uh, from an European point of view, uh, security have been uh, uh, treated um, um, as a um, as a topic, as a as a matter to 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 face, uh, for sure, the, the terrorism uh, have um, increased uh, this importance, and uh, since 2014, but also in 2015, the European agenda on security has uh, underlined uh, more and more uh, this importance, uh, uh, the importance of security, and uh, it has followed. Uh, the urban agenda uh, launched in March uh, 2016 with the Pact of Amsterdam, but and all this approach, this um, um, this context, this politi politic, uh, policy context uh, has uh, uh, developed uh, um, an idea on secu of security uh, throughout an integrated approach. What does it mean? It means uh, that is not only an issues uh, uh, of only security, but is a, a lot of um, um, topics that are related also uh, of, this, uh, of these issues. Uh, and of course, uh, um, one of the um, point uh, we, we try to concentrate is the security where in public spaces and not in other spaces. Uh, why? Because public spaces, of course, are uh, shared by people and people can uh, react, can, uh, can live, and where the social cohesion and inclusion um, are, are dealt with. Uh, so um, uh, let me see that I just move, okay, uh, the, the bar. Um, so it's important to, to try to understand the public spaces and how security uh, can be applied, uh, because one of the things um, that was also the beginning of the tonight uh, project has uh, the matter of security and perception of security in uh, empty spaces uh, or uh, full spaces uh, where people uh, concentrate, but also where people uh, uh, um, don't don't stay, for example, and for sure during the nights. So uh, the action plan released in November uh, 2020 concre uh, contain a concrete measure to uh, to face um, uh, the, the security, but also um, some guidelines uh, uh, for every administration every every country to to apply uh, to, to, to to work in a partnership for for security in public spaces uh, and um, in this um, landscape uh, it's important to talk about uh, the EFUS, the European Forum of Urban Security that now um, put together around 2,250 uh, uh, cities and regions from around uh, 15 countries. And what does uh, this uh, partnership, this network uh, 
do. Uh, well, since uh, 1987, uh, it's a network that is dedicated to try to, to put together issues, uh, to try to discuss, uh, to, to make uh, the country cooperate and support uh, uh, also local and regional uh, authorities uh, in the field of crime prevention in urban security. And uh, one of the action uh, that they did, uh, it was to, to write a manifesto uh, in 2017, uh, that it translated uh, in uh, different language, uh, especially in the in those countries where a national forum uh, work, uh, for example, for for Italy, um, and this. Um, um, this manifesto uh, is entitled Security, Democracy and Cities, Co-Producing Urban Security Polity, uh, Policies. Uh, so they try to um, develop uh, um, tools, ideas and best practice also to, to face uh, uh, problems together. Uh, sorry. Uh, well, and EFUS is also one of the partners of tonight project that we are going to, to explain. Um, and, um, um, and it's important to say that inside the EFUS network, there is a, a working group uh, on uh, nightlife. Uh, there are different topics um, um, that uh, EFUS uh, try to analyze uh, and to work with. And one of these uh, is uh, the responsible nightlife. Uh, um, this working group is also, is also uh, organized together with uh, the nightlife platform, the platform de la Vie Nocturne, uh, that is a, um, a platform based in um, Barcelona, uh, where also there are a lot of people active uh, to develop uh, uh, this uh, uh, these topics and EFUS is involved uh, not only in tonight project but also in other project connected with the security for example the, the, the shine uh, well and what about uh, the italian uh, policy context uh, uh, valeria if you want to go yes. ahead i can keep uh, going very briefly uh, moving from the EU policy context and look at the Italian one, we, we will see some um, key words that actually uh, remain the same um, and some additional one. Uh, the one that remained the same is this idea of integrated security, like we do security not only with policemen, to say it very briefly, but we do security through urban uh, generation, social policy. So let's say a very, um, we could say democratic idea of how to deal with uh, security. And a second uh, important pillar, if we look at the Italian context is this idea of multi-level governance. So uh, even if uh, public security is a responsibility of the central state, when we move to urban security, the central law role is uh, given to the municipalities. So local policies are the one that really uh, matters because it's in the city, in the public space of the city, that um, security becomes something uh, real that you can uh, touch. And urban security is um, considered um, as a multidimensional concept uh, that can that is uh, summarized as a public good uh, aim at improving quality of life and quality of the urban uh, spaces. As in the EU, we can change slide. Uh, also in Italy, we have a forum, uh, an Italian forum that deal with urban security since very uh, back. Uh, in the past, it was established in 1996 and uh, involved different level of local governments and can be considered one of the um, key network that try to uh, elaborate on uh, public security to um, translate into practice this idea of uh, integrated security, where the integration of different tools and different uh, uh, players 
uh, within the city that has uh, the key uh, role uh, are the main uh, point uh, and also with this idea of policy transfer between city. So all good, <laughs> um, no. Um, or to say better, if we try to focus on what is our concern, that is the night, we try to discover, we, we, we see that uh, uh, even if it's more than 25 years that they are elaborating on um, secure urban security, there is no specific policy for the night. The night is almost never the focus of the intervention, even if the night is very relevant, is when things occur, but all the activities, all the policy are more are uh, based on the phenomena. So we are dealing with um, uh, ethnic shop open uh, across uh, all the night. We are dealing with uh, noise at night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we never focus on the night as the echo uh, system. The night is like a, a time different from the day where things happen. So we could say that the night is, is central when we discuss about urban security, but actually is neglected. Is there is like a kind of ghost in the, in the dark. Francesca? And now we move to the project. Yes, and that's why also the Urban Innovative Action uh, um, financial uh, support uh, um, selected the Tonight project that was presented by the municipality of Turin uh, together with other, other partners um, because uh, they consider the project relevant. Uh, why? Uh, because it tried to, as uh, Valeria said, to approach security uh, uh, and during the night, uh, especially, not only with uh, policemen and uh, with arms, say, with a, with a um, we can say, uh, top-down approach, but also try to um, fertilize uh, um, and uh, uh, stimulate uh, uh, the space, uh, the, the neighborhood uh, to um, to consider uh, these uh, spaces uh, more uh, safe. And uh, how they try to do it? Uh, the four main activity were the first one, it was done uh, and develop a, a research, an ethnographic and social research, uh, trying to um, of course, talk with all the stakeholders uh, and trying to understand the citizen perception of a urban security. But doesn't mean uh, how uh, it was the real uh, level of uh, security, but also the perception that is another thing uh, that can change also the real uh, um, risk of living or visiting that places. The second activity was to develop a, a urban urban digital platform to analyze uh, the data, existing and uh, newly established data, uh, trying to understand better the urban security, but also the urban insecurity of the city, and uh, uh, to provide uh, uh, to the public administration a new tool, a technological tool to support the decision in a, an innovative way. And uh, these two activity uh, have, have been followed, uh, are following uh, because uh, the project uh, will end uh, in next year, in 2002, probably also in one more year. Um, it followed by the urban regeneration intervention, so physical intervention along the Dora River. Why the Dora River? Uh, because uh, uh, it's a river of Turin, um, but all people know the Po River and not the Dora. Even Dora is, uh, it was very uh, important for development of the city, but also because over there, it concentrates a very multicultural uh, uh, neighborhood. Many uh, immigrants live there and uh, it is considered a more uh, unsafe place. 
But over there, it is also uh, a new uh, university campus have been uh, uh, built. And this area uh, is particularly problematic uh, because uh, um, um, it was not uh, so much integrated with the rest of the, of the city. And uh, during night, uh, it is uh, uh, empty uh, or it could be too much full in other areas. So um, before um, other activity, it to try to ask people to try to develop a project to be able to regenerate uh, the night, uh, regenerate the idea of living and to have a more balanced uh, um, situation uh, in, uh, in the place. In not only immigrants, not only students, uh, but more balance, uh, a mixing, uh, a place that more mixed uh, where people are not too much uh, concentrated but in neither uh, too empty spaces could be probably uh, a better space a more integrated and more safe as well from a, a, um, a perception point of view of course so uh, this idea also to create uh, uh, services new services and to make uh, the night uh, work in a different way of, uh, of the day and if we uh, move to the first step that the project has taken, we, we really start seeing uh, that some issue came uh, rise, uh, even if this was supposed to be a project that focused on uh, night. The first point is when the city um, launched the call for proposal, and had a great success with more than 80 um, projects uh, sent. Um, the call that was supposed to address liability and perception of security in the evening and at night uh, still struggle with the idea that the night is a central as a policy area. Uh, among the 19 projects that were financed, only seven proposals focus as, uh, specifically on uh, the night, other eight projects just uh, transfer the activity that normally has done in the daytime at uh, nighttime, and four proposals do not even mention clearly the relationship between their activity and, um, and the night. When uh, we look at the approach uh, towards security, the approach is really uh, basic and tend to be very uh, deterministic uh, and it's still unclear how this activity because the, the the rationale of the project is we will develop services as Francesca uh, was saying and then we integrate these services that focus uh, on, at night with the strategy um, of uh, the city, but is probably first unclear if the city has a strategy, a night strategy, uh, and how this activity will integrate with the um, activity of uh, run by this uh, project. And the last point, very quickly, because we are running uh, out of time, um, this idea of the data platform that is still at the very uh, beginning, um, is facing, as always, in especially in Southern European country, with the problem of finding good data with good quality and also uh, a clear policy. Uh, when you want to uh, use data, you need to have clear which is the aim that you have. And last slide. So just to give you the uh, just to keep the discussion for later we are asking to uh, actually to our service um, me and francesca like should the level of awareness of the night as an as a specific ecosystem to be improved uh, in the um, public actors like municipalities or other level of government and is can really the night become uh, an area for specific public uh, policy that will not just uh, law and order uh, usual uh, stuff? And um, we left uh, all the audience with these two questions. Thank you very much and apologies for being slightly late. <laughs>